Jill, thanks for joining us on the We Move podcast. <laughs> thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. It's nice to have podcasters in person. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Zoom, uh, a lot of podcasts happen, happen via Zoom these days. I'd say 97% yeah. of all podcasts I've done have been not with the people. It's a different conversation, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It feels much more Zoom. functional, doesn't it, when you do a Zoom conversation? Yeah. Like, Fu in, in functional, and out. like in the room? No, functional is in... Oh, functional in terms of convenience. Yeah. 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 I think in the room, what's interesting is that we can pick up just from our emotional cues like immediately and so the over talking or the natural interruptions that happen in conversation are more natural yeah versus yeah even that yeah <laughs> well the very first issue we went we came out to see carl powley which would have been before zoom not before skype and just having that we found by coming to people's before zoom existed well it would have been before 20, we knew of zoom oh. before we knew of zoom yeah <laughs> okay. so 2015 yeah 2015 wow. yeah and we found by coming to people's homes or coming to people's, you know, areas that they live in, it worked really effectively for us to, yeah. to build some type it's of connection. It's much more comfortable for us to come and see you because you're in your own space. Same with Carl. He could take yeah. us around. Yeah, the commute was brutal from my backyard to here. Just <laughs> the traffic I had to go through. The and you're with all your stuff. We find toys. it when you're just traveling. It's the yeah. hard work. Yeah. You know. But you guys are traveling now. Yeah, I think yeah. that's kind of being english ah i think that's what we do we go around the world roundabout find things <laughs> yeah <laughs> turn around to come wherever back. you can find a roundabout <laughs> you'll yeah. do it we've seen more roundabouts here actually than we've ever seen yeah puzzling yeah in la uh Help some me. in vegas oh. a few in venice yeah venice california folks <laughs> yeah not venice yeah. Philly. Mm -hmm. um so i wanted to come and talk to you because um I first bought, I don't even know how I came across your work, but I, I bought a pair of the balls in 2014, I think. Ooh. And I remember being in a hotel room with a friend of mine going, I just, yeah, I, I guess my back must have been really sore because I distinctly remember telling him like, you've got to try these on your back. And then I discovered trying them on my glutes, mm. which was perhaps the most painful thing I've ever done at that time. Well met. They were, my glutes were much uh, tighter than I'd ever realized in my life. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's how I came across your work. And then over the years, you just kind of followed along with what you're doing and then uh, noticed that you knew Brian and we'd become really good friends with Brian over the past few years. Mm. And um, when we saw him at the Art of Breath uh, seminar in London a few, few months ago, I mm. said, Brian, can you uh, introduce us to Jill? We're going to be in LA. That's so sweet. I'm so touched. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, I've been touching you for the last, I guess, six or seven years yeah. through my, yeah, through yeah, my, yeah. my product. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, you probably had yoga tune-up balls, or you might have had plus balls by then. We started with they were green. They were those yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so we have the yoga tune-up balls. If for the listeners who don't know, they're basically small, pliable, grippy rubber balls, a little bit smaller than tennis balls, that are designed for manual therapy. So they're designed for self-manual therapy, or also known as frequently known as self-myofascial release. But they give your body uh, tactile stimulus where you get feedback about where your tension is, where you might be excessively over taught from overtraining. We call these body blind spots. So areas of overuse, underuse, misuse, or body confusion. So our goal with our tools is that you can self treat, but really the self treatment is about mapping yourself and getting to know and getting familiar with all your layers, your, your home, so that you can then make corrections in your movement practice or your exercise practice or whatever other protocols you do. So that eventually the therapy balls, you know, they don't hurt and they don't feel uncomfortable, um, but their, their texture and your texture are more alike. So human tissue is very pliable. It's very soft when it's healthy and when it's well perfused, when the fascial tissues are adapting well, but if you're in a state of chronic tension, either from overtraining, undertraining, emotional stress, um, you're going to feel like a rock instead of like a, mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of soft and pliable. Yeah. So that is a lot of in our pedagogy is helping people to get familiar with their tissue layers and um, increase their adaptation or their adaptability to tolerating pressure, 
and manipulating these tools through their bodies. So you met the smallest balls and then we have other sides too. <laughs> I was with a, a guy that I train with who's a manual therapist and we were talking about something and he said, yeah, a Chinese, I can't remember if it was a Chinese weightlifter or weightlifting coach said you should be able to like push, your muscles should be so soft that you can just touch the bone touch the bone yeah yeah i mean and that's actually dependent on where it is in the body also i mean yeah. we have these natural passive structures called fascia and fascia has different densities depending on where it is in your body naturally it needs to have different tautnesses um, just due to use for example your iliotibial tract your it band which really is the tendon of the gluteus maximus maximus and your tensor fascia lata, it is naturally taut. It, it needs to be. It is your lateral stability. When you're walking forward, you don't want to have right. tons of sway to the side. So your iliotibial tracts adapt to become a, a more rigid structure in general. So some places on your body, very, it should be very easy to get all the way to the bone. Other places Such on your as. body? Um, well, this was interesting. So this weekend I taught, um, I co-led a course. My, my friend Katie Bowman and I are creating a course called Walking Well, a stepwise approach to an everyday movement. And so we brought our training teams together from all over the world and we did a uh, sort of a think tank this weekend here in Los Angeles. And her husband, Michael Curran, who's just amazing, and I'll tell you why he's so amazing in a second, was in the workshop also. We were doing a glute release, going back to your... <laughs> I'm still working on them. <laughs> rolling your bottom moment when, you know, that first moment when it's like, um, you know, it's like checking the oil level in your car, right? It, like when you check how much oil you have, you just put the stick in and you're like, oh, I have tons of oil or, oh my gosh, there's so little. When the ball touches you right away, you get familiar with the texture of your own tension. And so that the texture of tension, like I could talk about texture of tension for hours like this is my what I like to talk about um but anyway you get that feedback right away about that the holding in the tissue and whether that holding is because there is agglomerated connective tissue there is a abundant amounts of adhesive um un ungliding fascial tissues and then the muscles that are all caught up in there and they're not um the, 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 the waste products from those cells are not moving out well. And so you just get, it feels stingy when you get touched there mm. because of the poor, um, the poor garbage in, garbage out, right? yep. to put it mildly or to put it simply. So Michael is in the classroom and we're rolling out the glutes and I'm trying to demonstrate something called a gluteal plow. And what a gluteal plow is, is you have two, either the yoga tuna balls or the plus balls on the side of the hip where the iliotibial band where the, is the myotendons junction. So it's where the tendon stops and the muscle begins. And this is a great border to actually get into the muscle layer. So you place the balls there and then in slow motion, you move your butt basically towards your sacrum. So you're sliding the entire glute mass as one mass towards the sacrum. So imagine, you know, your butt cheek, uh, has potentially fallen off the side of your leg from years and years of sitting. And so what this gluteal plow does, it puts your butt back on your butt where it belongs so that it can mobilize your coxal joint, which is your hip, your hip joint, instead of having fallen off the side. So this move, the gluteal plow, the therapy balls sweep the tush towards the sacrum. And if you are very supple, if you're able to have those muscles turned off, the therapy balls will actually skim the bone. You'll be on the periosteum and you'll be able to get deep to the medius deep to the minimus and then sweep along the bone it's mm -hmm. a really wonderful sensation something i do regularly um uh, for my own glute i had a hip replacement a couple years ago and so this is one of the moves for me to help with my scar path so um people are struggling with this move they're like i don't understand it i don't understand how to get deeper than my maximus. I just feel like the balls are rolling across my tush. I'm not able to mm. move, move the soft tissue in one clump. And so I, uh, and Michael was actually struggling with it. He's like, I'm not really feeling this. And so I said, just flip over. And then I put my foot on the side of his tush. I put the balls of my foot just where the yoga tune-up balls were. And then I was moving his bottom with pressure. And 
I, you know, slow, and I, I slid like I was on, on an ice skating rink because he's so supple that I just went and slipped right down to the bone. Wow. And the reason he's not, quote unquote, feeling it is because he has no discomfort there. So people think that it has to hurt to work, but if you are, if your tissues are incredibly resilient and they're healthy, they are going to feel like a wonderful spongy squish when they're touched with pressure and it won't be an annoying feeling. So this, your trainer, um, yeah. who's, you know, is absolutely right. Tissue should be compliant. And then at will, when you're sending the right neurological stresses to them, they will contract and they will be like rigid rubber to e execute the task at hand. Yeah. So we should be able to be completely off when we're off and on when we're on. And the problem is, is that we're always partly on yeah. and we live with these chronic aches and pains because our muscles are so stressed out because our brains are saying, I think you need a little bit of tension here now. Just, just be a little tight. Can't tell you why, but um, 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 right? And that's stress. I was about to ask, you, you mentioned the word, uh, the words chronic tension at the beginning. It's, is there anyone that kind of lives this? I live in London. <laughs> is there anyone in London that's not under chronic tension all the time? <laughs> Okay, or, so or any major city. Or... This is such a great question because this brings me back to Michael Curran, Katie Bowman's husband. So I had a chance to speak. And then, I mean, every time I would go over to him and if I had to adjust him, I'd be like, can I just touch your deltoid now? And I'd, I'd just slip right into the bone. The man is, and, and he's very strong. He's soft as silk everywhere. He's like pudding. It's amazing. And when he needs to be strong, he can be. So I said, well, what, you know, what's your secret? <laughs> I said, oh, I've been meditating for decades. And I was like, ah. Because he felt, his tissue felt to me, there's only one other person I've ever touched that felt like that to me. And that's mm -hmm. my mentor, Glenn Black, who has spent more time meditating than he has interacting with other humans. You know, this is, that's his thing. He's like a massive meditator, body worker, um, yoga practitioner, um, rogue. He's totally not on the map. He doesn't have a brand. He doesn't promote himself. He didn't write a book. You know, I mean, actually he did write a book, which I edited. But How did you discover him then? Um... I discovered him, I started working at the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies. It's a Holistic Studies Institute in upstate New York. When I was 18 years old, during my summers at college, I would um, you know, have my year, I don't know how, I discovered it through massage. I was studying massage and my massage teacher, while I was in college, I was also studying shiatsu massage because I was just, I wasn't stimulated enough and I, I needed some healing and I'm lucky I stumbled into uh, this shiatsu center and thus began, began my path into the healing arts, um, into the touch healing arts. Uh, anyway, my teacher had mentioned, or a colleague of my teacher had mentioned this place, Omega, and that, that was a great place for college kids to go during the summer. You know, you didn't earn any money, but you got to live in a tent in exchange for working there. Uh, and so that's what I did. And I discovered my, my teacher there, because he was a massage therapist in the healing arts center that was on the campus, but he also taught yoga classes to the staff every morning at 7 a.m. And, um, and he's a master. I mean, he's one of these living masters that, um, um, you know, has very few students. And I'm just like, my whole chest is getting flooded right now because I feel so um, blessed that this man came into my life at such a young age. Uh, he does, does still teach. He teaches occasionally at Omega, and, and he also teaches in Switzerland at Kieltal uh, once a year. And sometimes he teaches in Zurich. Yeah, but you guys would, yeah, I, I recommend him to everybody. But it's just one of those, like, when you are ready, you will find Glenn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. you, would, you yeah, would... we were talking about Michael. Yes. But the yes. point is that Glenn's tissue is so incredibly supple from his meditation practice, also his self-care practice, which is a lot of self-massage, and then the yoga that he does, um, or what he calls human movement. But... Yeah, and, and so I, I do think that w meditators, uh, because they're allowed to, they, they, you know, the process of meditation, you can unbridle these unconscious uh, stresses. You can intercept them much more quickly than the average bear who, or the average dog, who are just reacting to squirrels all the time, mm -hmm. right? And the meditator is really able to not see them as a disturbance to their well-being. And so I'm just, I mean, I haven't sat down for, for an hour and talked with Michael, but I, that's just what I picked up through, just through touching his tissue. And if you've touched enough bodies, you, you know, you get it right away. You're like, mm, this is very good Kobe beef. 
<laughs> um, so Sorry, you go. should be able to cross from one to the other. You know, squat as well as practice yoga. You know, do CrossFit if if your body is yeah to be highly tense and then. Oof. Well, practicing yoga doesn't mean that you're not tense. I mean, the practice of yoga. I mean, or yogas. There's so many different yeah. types of yogas. Um, I think one of the great things about yogas in general is they build a tremendous amount. There's there's a big part of it that, which is self study, savadaya. So you um, are deliberately sent into self, uh, becoming aware of your habits, becoming aware of your thoughts, becoming aware of um, your body, mm -hmm. your position, your breath, um, your thoughts. So I implicit in most yoga practices is a, a massive amount of awareness instruction um and that's just part of the of the practice but i i think that there's a big movement in the yoga space now towards functional training um and i think yoga is having a big awakening moment right now mm -hmm. recognizing that um, a lot of the positional like the excessive dependency on isometric positions um, has been detrimental to joint health and that's a that's a whole other conversation. I have it frequently yeah. with with yoga podcasts to tell people um, you might want to lift things and pull on things and yeah. pull things, not pull on not pull on joints, but pull things, pull external forces to load your tissues differently. Yeah, um, yeah. is that what you were asking? Yeah, about? well, my, I remember my yoga teacher, so I have an Ashtanga practice. Ah, and, and she was like, "You should stop, stop doing CrossFit," and I was like. But I enjoy being under load. Yes. Like it just feels good yes. to be underweight or pushing or and I was like, oh and I was like, okay, we'll see where it goes if I stop. Mm hmm But it didn't necessarily Did you stop? I, I did stop. Yes. Kind of played around with it, just seeing where it goes. Yeah. And then I go, oh, actually I need to be strong and then Yeah. Another teacher said the purpose of primary is to remove strength from the body, get everything working, then when you go into intermediate, then you start strengthening. And I was like, okay, interesting. Quite vulnerable for me to not be strong with a climbing background. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I enjoy being strong. Yeah. So just more mental for me to play around with that than physical. But interesting, the what different tribes say you should do. It, like, it oh, is, don't do that. It is mostly uninformed by science by biomechanics, by kinesiology. I'll tell you that because I'm from the yoga space and this is what I've been bringing to the yoga space for the past 14 years is some sense about the structures that are under our types of load in yoga asana and whether or not this is really the best choice for your structure for the long term. So um, there are still um, many tribalistic beliefs and many, many uh, mythological beliefs, uh, beliefs and mystical beliefs that are at crosshairs with, um, with human anatomy. So I get, I get a little bit righteous and a little bit indignant because, uh, you know, I did these practices for decades and I, I paid a price big time mm -hmm. for, um, doing headstand, shoulder stand, plow pose for 15 minutes every day you know, putting all that pressure on my cervical mm. spine for doing front to back splits, for doing positions from Ashtanga first mm. and second series where my feet were behind my head, where I was doing Lotus jumping back from Lotus. I used to wake up at age 25 um, when I was doing first series every day, except moon days, right? And I would walk to the bathroom with my knees bent because I couldn't straighten them. I had overstretched my ligaments Every morning doing the practice, my knees were in agony. I would get up out of bed, and it's in my book. I talk about it in the role model. I would walk to the bathroom like this because I, I, it took me this long. By the time I got to the bathroom, I could sit down, and then I could stand up after you know wow. that first pee of the day. Um, but that is not what a 25-year-old who is um, athletic should be feeling in yeah. the morning. And, um, and I have the hip rotation. I can easily, you know, Lotus wasn't a problem. Putting my legs behind my head wasn't a problem. The problem was, um, the frequency I was doing it, the volume I was doing it and the lack of variability of other mm. 
modes of exercise. So had I been doing weightlifting at that time, I would have still been able to put my legs behind my head. I would have just had healthier capsules and, yeah. and whatnot. Now, so now I'll, I'll never put my legs behind my head again because now I just see it as a really bad idea. And he's done it. <laughs> <laughs> done it like, got the picture <laughs> did it yeah this is before instagram kids this is before instagram could do all sorts of stuff both my legs behind my head and lock both my arms behind my body not proud of it it's called hypermobility and um people who are hypermobile of course it's like well you feel it feels amazing it feels amazing to get into those positions you're having these transcendent experiences um and you don't know what the cost is but i'll tell you at 47 because i'm 47 now i know what the cost is bone spurs, um, spinal fracture. Just learned this the other day. I didn't even know I had a spinal fracture. Got an x-ray for something else. And they're like, oh, look at that. There's a spinal fracture. Wow. Must have done that years ago in yoga. Like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Yeah, no kidding. Mm, interesting. And is this then the origin, does this then go towards how you developed the business uh, that you're in now with you? I, you know what? It's so interesting. I think absolutely the yoga tune-up and the role model are programs that set me straight, that were therapeutic from the get-go, that started to unwind, well, what are we actually doing in a yoga pose? How, how do I, you know, if I'm trying to help somebody to, to, let's just talk about like downward dog, which is basically handstand with feet on the ground, right? If I'm trying to help somebody understand um, what is the most stable position for their shoulders in handstand, I have to then help them understand, well, what is upward rotation of the scapula? What are the muscles that help that scapula to upwardly rotate and protract? What is external rotation of the glenohumeral joint? What is pronation of the forearm, like, or the wrist? So you have to learn mechanics. You actually have to learn about your joints and then the muscles that control them and the fascial tissues that are either yielding or not yielding. Um, and then use exercises to stimulate the body so that that person's body can then map themselves through the articulations. What I love about yoga in general is it's happening really slowly. Mm. So you can really take the time to, you know, and people in general, well, in the type of classes I create, um, people are really there for ed the education, the, uh, the moving into the body and then feeling like they both had a, physical therapy session and a massage by the time they walk out the door, which is, which happens in every class, whether it's 30 minutes or, you know, a five day training, a seven day training. So I think people come to our work knowing that something is hurting. Um, something is not just clicking right and they're ready to unwind their, they're ready to, um, unroll their old assumptions about, their body and movement. And, and I'm still learning every day from what I teach. I mean, I'm always humbled by my students and their, what they bring. And then using this model that I've created with them to help them clue in to their own body sense hmm. rather than cue them into their body sense. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the empowering side of hmm. a good teacher. It's almost, you teach someone to feel for themselves to find their way yeah yeah in and is that dark. linked with emotions mm. and like it's like yeah you said it's um it's how you shows people kind of how to think ch uh, challenge their assumptions yeah which are layered yeah i and it's hard especially for teachers who've been in the game for um decades i mean we'll have people who are they have a robust community they're in books they have books um, and they come in because they're, they're very broken at this point by yoga, most usually. And um, to then just peel back the curtain layer by layer so that they can start to see what, um, what they've bought into, right? Some of the promise of yoga that they bought into that seemed like it was this second coming that we we need a lot of diversity <laughs> in our movement practices for health and um it's sad to let go of that one thing that was your snuggle blanket or that has kept you afloat 
I mean, for me, it was two plus hours of practice and then another, you know, 30 to 45 minutes of meditation. Mm. I needed that much to regulate me. That's a lot, right? Three hours a day out of your life away from other people. And what I really needed to do was get my shit straight with other people. How did you discover that that's what you really needed to do? I'm still discovering it. I'm a mom now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm still discovering it. You know, um, one of the programs I have is called the Breath and Bliss Immersion. And we Mm. use uh, polyvagal theory as the lens for this three-day course. Are you familiar with polyvagal theory? Could you explain it? I've had some some experience with it. How much time do you have? (laughs) 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 Just because, uh, you know, I'm sure there's people that are listening that don't know what polyvagal theory is. Yeah. So let let me just frame it this way because you asked me the question uh, you know how did you learn that um how did you learn that you needed to communicate or that other people were the answer i mean the answer was well why was i spending so much time isolating myself and then the, the practice let me keep isolating because there is a lot of virtue in being that sort of stoic yogi mm. in the literature and um but i was i was suffering but the, the more I practiced, the more I, it would, would stifle, not stifle, it would sublimate my suffering and give me this temporary release. So, you know, and I had bad relationships and boyfriend after boyfriend, it was like nothing was, nothing was lasting. So that's one of the ways that I, that I learned that. Um, so in the, so uh, about five years ago, I taught the first Breath and Bliss Immersion um, here in Los Angeles. And one of my students, one of our teachers at the time, his name is Dr. Chris Walling. He is a somatic psychotherapist and he's actually now the head of a organization called the United States Association of Body Psychotherapy. And you all have a a like community in England or in Europe. And I think they're based in England and maybe it's the European uh, body psychotherapy organization. But anyway, these are the psychotherapists who believe that touch is an important part of of psycho, of healing of their psychotherapeutic healing and touch therapy was um, completely expunged from psychotherapy around you know Reich was jailed and that was the end of him right but he was onto something that you know our body our, our psychology is our body's physiology yeah speaking to us very loudly right and so now getting back to polyvagal theory so what polyvagal theory oh my god we're gonna jump all over the place to try to explain this so uh, after chris took my course he took me out for coffee and he said i need to tell you about dr stephen porges you need to know about this because you're teaching his work but you don't even know you're teaching it and then he explained um porges polyvagal theory to me and told me to start reading his his literature. So Dr. Porges is a uh, researcher. He's based now um, in Indiana at the Kinsey Institute. His wife, Sue Carter, is the um, world's leading expert on oxytocin. So she has done more studies on the love hormone, the bonding hormone, um, and has, um, I read, I came across her work, um, I think, maybe 15, 18 years ago, I I picked up a book called The General Theory of Love. And this book changed my life. It helped me be able to bond with people (laughs) better. I'm not saying I'm on the spectrum. I'm just kind of like, I've got Mm. lots going on, uh, which was preventing me from bonding well. But in in this book, General Theory of Love, they talked about her studies with prairie voles and vasopressin and oxytocin. and, And that helped me to understand why I was feeling the way I would feel in relationships and especially after relationships ended and my kind of obsessive need to stay connected to somebody who harmed me or hurt me, right? So this book really helped me. Her name was in that, but his name wasn't. So I just have to frame that because it's probably going to come up in a minute. Sorry, can you just remind us yeah. the name of the book? Oh, A General Theory of Love General is, theory of love. is I, I recommend this to like anybody who has trouble in relationships get it start to understand the physiology and that will help you it will help you with understanding what you're feeling so that you're feeling you're not victimized by your feelings but you understand them as physiology and that these are reactions that are perfectly biologically normal um and when i start to understand things physiologically or biologically i'm much more at peace with the reactions my body's having i don't have to 
get carried away with um, blaming myself for having these experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're one of these like super sensitive people that feel everything, like like you feel every heartbeat. You know, it's not it's not it's not magic. It's just you're extremely sensitized to what's called interoception, and having heightened interoception is is a gift and a curse. It's a mm -hmm. curse in that. Um, uh, your body speaks very, very loudly instead of softly and gently to you. All right. So, Stephen Porges. So, Porges has a theory called polyvagal theory. And what it does is it describes the evolution of the vagus nerve and the adaptations that our species as humans um, in order to become a human, the adaptations that the vagus nerve went through over the last, whatever, millions and millions of years. And so um, when people think of the vagus nerve, they often think, ah, this is the 10th cranial nerve. This is the nerve that helps regulate the heart. It helps, it, somehow it's involved with the relaxation response and, and that's about it. But what um, Porges has brought to light is that um, the vagus has gone through many different adaptations depending on um, uh, how we broke through in different, what is it, genus, species, mammalia, help me with the history of evolution here. But as we broke through and we became no longer tortoises that had to hibernate underwater and conserve energy, but then we became um, monkey Right. Monkey people, monkeys, <laughs> and had face-to-face -face interactions, and we had to tend to our young for much longer periods of time for our offspring to develop into normal adults. And so that um, vagus nerve became appropriated not just as um, a nerve that went to the subdiaphragmatic organs of digestion, um, and then, of course, regulating the heart and innervating the lungs in many ways, but also another stalk grew from the same source nuclei and it went forward and it um, conjoined with different facial and vocal nerves. So um, is it nerve? So accessory, hypoglossus, facial, trigeminal, um, and laryngeal nerves. These are all sharing source nuclei with the vagus and so anything that helps our child to regulate with us such as cooing um sighing sucking swallowing breathing which is the sighing part um, is part of a vagus complex and so we have two different complexes we have the ventral vagus that helps us to interact and stay connected to one another to create safety. And then we have the vagus that goes to the lungs and heart, and we have the vagus that plunges through the diaphragm into the viscera. Um, but when we're in extreme life threat, the vagus that goes to our organs and to our heart is hyper aroused. And when the vagus is hyper aroused, you will pass out you will faint. So we're familiar with fight or flight mm -hmm. and freeze. And our freeze state is when we are stimulated in a way where uh, we are paralyzed by fear. And the paralysis by fear, the thing that controls that is the vagus. So it's not just like the peace and love nerve. It's also the don't feel pain upon being eaten by the lion nerve. Right, so the reason that we pass out is the same reason um, why a reptile can, you know, lose its bowels, go underwater, and be there for hours and hours without oxygen. It lowers its metabolic demand. So we have that same part of us as mammals, but when we recover, we don't recover like <laughs> we don't recover like a lizard. We recover our adaptation response to the trauma is going to be different based on our entire developmental history. So if you were, if you had life threat as a child later in life, you are more likely to have a certain uh, number of different pathologies that are related to having the developmental wound at that age versus having a life threat maybe at 28 
years old for the first time. Does that make sense? So what he's able to show through polyvagal theory is how our adaptation, how our responses are, they're totally biologically embedded in us. Um, but then our survival strategies, um, like how we cope, um, is going to differ just based on our environmental surroundings, our, how we were parented, or how we've learned to uh, use our ventral vagal system, which is what I'm looking at you with right now, with eye contact, with um, occasional smiles, back and forth, trying to see if you're listening and we're mm -hmm. communicating on a level. Like, are we able to actually engage with another? So the ultimate sort of um, meme that Porges used is polyvagal theory, really our, our biological imperative is to be safe in the arms of another. That co-regulation is how we, survive, uh, how we survive as a species. So we have this ventral vagal system of face-to-face -face communication, vocal prosody, the tone of voice, um, and um, shared experience. When that's online, then the, the, the stuff that's going to shut down your organs is not going to shut down your organs. Like this co-regulation keeps us going. It keeps social, uh, social contact going. It keeps culture going forward. Right now, m many of us, myself included, in the U.S., because I'm, I'm a certain political belief system, I'm in a very heightened sympathetic state. I'm in a state of agitation and fear um, on a daily basis when I open up the news because I'm, I have a completely different perspective than what our leadership is saying. And so anxiety is extremely high right now. So the sympathetic arousal is there. I'm just, I'm not under life threat yet, right? Like we're not, um, but there are people in this country who are under life threat. They're locked in cages on the, on the border of Mexico. And so we have these, um, these, this constant sympathetic arousal. And so the way to um, be get back into better cognitive function and decision making, again, is through ventrovagal contact and making sure that we connect with other people to help make better decisions and not just fly off the seat of our pants and react in terror and um, in fear all the time. So I, I'm kind of going meandering all over, but there's three, there's basically three zones in polyvagal theory. We have this ventral vagal, we have a sympathetic zone, which is animation, it's, it's the doing, it's um, um, sympathetic arousal, but sympathetic can also mean play, sympathetic can also mean physical activity, physical exercise, and then there's the dorsal vagal, which is that shutdown place. So the simplest way to learn this is in an embodied way. I have a challenge time just talking it out loud. Um, in an embodied way, you can visit these different zones, and we do this through palpation and through position and through breath practice, and, and I help people to really understand and embed what each of these zones mean. The mm -hmm. subdiaphragmatic, the supradiaphragmatic, and then the supraclavicular, which is ventral vagal is the supraclavicular, Super diaphragmatic is the lung heart region, and then the subdiaphragmatic is those visceral organs. Um, and we typically use something like the gorgeous ball that you've met before to induce pressures um, and get people familiar with the, their biology, the physiology, and then the sort of the neuroanatomy of how the vagus innervates each of these areas. And, and what these it means. gorgeous, yeah, balls. gorgeous ball. There are. They're like a mini micro Swiss ball. That's how I describe it to someone. Yeah, it's a very gushy, pliable ball that has a lot of grip. And so this grip uh, sticks to the skin and it creates uh, pressure and tissue shear. So it excites the skin, excites the sensory neurons in the skin and in the fatty layer underneath the skin, the superficial fascia. And then the intent with this is to um, really excite different regions of of tissue and pressure on bones so that you can get feedback one about your respiration and i know that my friend brian in his art of breast seminar uses the gorgeous ball mm -hmm. um like how i instruct for respiratory feedback there are many other ways to um to use this uh, with different w modes of pressure and then bringing in anatomical specificity to do uh, visceral releases um, and then, then to do neur neural stimulations and um, 
lots of things, even deflated. We, we figured this out yesterday. We could do some things deflated with it um, to stimulate the retinacula in a really special special way that I couldn't with the, the yoga tuna balls. The so. retinacula being? Oh, shoot. Now we're going to get into fascial anatomy. So the retinacula <laughs> are the really the thickened fascial um, bracelets, for lack of a better word, around your wrists and around your ankles that lock in the tendons that cross from the forearm into the hands or the lower leg into the feet. So you have a, an extra thick fascial bracketing here at the ends of your arms and at the ends of your legs. And uh, your retinacula happen to be particularly viscous. They have uh, one of the highest levels of hyaluronon of any fascial tissue in the body. This was recently found by Carla Stecco, who's one of the, the researchers that I've um, that I follow and that I um, met at the Fascia Research Congress, you know, many years mm. going. But yeah, she recently did a study on the the fascia sites, the cells that produce hyaluronan, and they're particularly um, abundant in the retinacula of your body, which makes sense because your ankles and your wrists have more differential movement than really any other part of your body, right? You think of how many different ways your ankle moves and the types of loads that are coming from the ground up or from the top down. And so it has to be a very slick, right, pivot yeah. point, doesn't it? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, so we got way off polyvagal. Did I answer your question? Do you have follow-up questions to that? <laughs> it's like a it's, lot. It's quite. It's a lot. A complex. <laughs> it's so complex, you guys. That yep. I was simply trying to just, if I focused on you, then I could <laughs> just about hang on. Yeah. So I don't. You know, I have some really simplified. Um, pictures on my Instagram feed because we've done some art through my my company Tune Up Fitness. We've done some really great like arts, yeah. arts, art pieces, graphics. Oh my gosh, graphic art that describes what I'm talking about in what a thousand words or less because that's what you're limited to on Instagram. <laughs> so I'd recommend going there first and digging in and I'm happy to share the mm. the graphics with you guys to share. They're beautiful. Yeah, that would be great. So these balls. The Cortis balls. Yes, this inflated they, pliable ball. My head's going, they, they make the body feel safe. Yes. Oh my God, yes. You said it. And it's that safety that allows one to release. Yes. Right. Yeah, this is, this is a, a primary state that we want people to be in when they're doing self-myofascial release because if you're still armored, you're just massaging against tension. And there are ways to massage against tension, but boy, is it a battle. Hmm. So um, we want to try to um, get into a parasympathetic state as rapidly and um, safely as possible. So sometimes going quickly into a parasympathetic state, you feel tremendous uh, vulnerability and fear. And there's actually people that have a phenomenon called relaxation-induced anxiety. It, sometimes you'll see people on a massage table or even in Shavasana, and they'll get into a certain depth. Well, no, the cry is, that's good. The cry is good. It's when the eyes pop open and they start, the eyes start going left, right, left, right, left, right. Like they're, they feel like they might be um, attacked, yeah. right? Or uh, all of a sudden their sympathetic nervous system says, you're not safe here. And then they just get zings of nerve rushes down the body. So that is, that is an adaptation of the body to this feeling of going into what we would call in yoga tune up a safe dorsal shutdown. So sh both Shavasana and the therapy balls take you into a safe shutdown place, right? If we're going back to polyvagal theory, we go into this place of, like you go into the cave and the cave is very dark inside mm. of yourself because when you start to slow down so much, then you start to feel, feel what you've been running from in your sympathetic zone. It's amazing how many people don't, in, in yoga, their shavasana is maybe a minute. That's not shavasana. Yeah. It's lying down, getting up again. Yeah, it takes minutes. Yeah. I it takes it, it takes fifteen minutes for every. What was it five minutes for every fifteen minutes of practice? Sure, I so I I you like twenty twenty five minutes. It, well, it, uh, here, so here's an interesting stat. So twenty minutes is where you want to max your shavasanas because when you go beyond twenty, you start to get the um, loss of reactivity in your muscle spindles. So you probably want to set your clock for 19 minutes and 58 seconds so that you don't <laughs> drift yeah. past that 20 minute. Yeah. But yeah, it, it actually, you will be less strong. So that's fine if you're just going to work um, or, you know, I remember when I was in one 
one course and we were meditating and doing tons of yoga, meditating Shavasana for it was very long, like 30 minutes. And I was a waitress at the time. And I used to be what they called the professora de comida. Like I was so on it. I was, I would get the most tips. Like I was just like their prize waitress. And then when I was in this training, all of my reaction times were slowing down. I couldn't get the, com um, hit the computer button as fast. Everything was slower. I was literally uh, like walking in slow-mo. I could not speed myself up. And it was because I was overdosing on my yoga and meditation. And so there is a dose. Interesting. Yeah. And so <laughs> 20 minutes is what they say is the maximum time for being able to have, you know, have your rec reactivity back. Um, you know, the zombies, you've been on retreat, right? You've turned into a zombie. It's kind of fun, mm. <laughs> but it's not very functional for the rest of the people in the world who yeah. are moving really fast. So, but you can also move fast and be still moving slow inside your mind. You can play ninja tricks. That's what's so cool about yoga practices and meditation practices. You start to have like so many insights and so many little ways that you can um, still be in your practice, but be, be in the world. Mm -hmm. This is going back to that isolationist thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much like need to be in the world, not away from it anymore. Yeah. So if the if these balls uh, allow the body to feel safe, yeah, and thus allow the tissue to release, yeah, that makes me think of um, the different options. Oh shit! That's okay. The Just different work. options to these to these balls, for example, like the guns or the as in the the guns that kind of hit, hit yeah. the muscles yeah. or I have another device that we picked up in whilst bouldering in, in France like a, a very Stop. solid plastic yeah. object that you would really grind down yeah. against the muscles but actually what that is doing is just tensing the muscle and making it harder to release well I uh, okay so England Taylor and Francis publishing company Possibly. Yeah. So Sounds English. I've just finished writing a chapter for a British publishing company called Taylor and Francis. They're a medical textbook company, or at least this book is a medical textbook for this publishing company. And it will be, it's the book is on fascia and it's being edited by David Lazondak, who wrote the book fascia, what it is and why it matters, which for my money is like the most fascia accessible book on the planet to explain the history of fascia, fascia, different, the current state of fascia for the everyday person, the everyday trainer, maybe not the everyday, the almost like it's a little bit, it is very for edu educators. I wouldn't say my mother would read it and be like, I get it now. But, um, but those of you who are in the training space, this is a, it's, it should be on your bookshelf and you should read it back and forth and understand it. Um, but the medical textbook is, uh, so David has been solicited by Taylor and Francis to put together a similar book, but for clinicians, for the medical professionals or future medical professionals. And he reached out to me to write the chapter on self-myofascial release. So I spent a good part of this year reading every article written on self-myofascial release, not every article, every published paper um, and some non-published papers on self-myofascial release um, to conglomerate what is known, what is not known, um, what's missing? What are the holes in research right now for self myofascial release? And one of the one of the things that interests me most, because it's my bias, is soft tool, hard tool mm. stuff. Um, n almost every, you know, like I said, I read pretty much every paper up until July. I stopped reading in I think late July when I turned in my chapter. Um, none of these papers are disclosing the uh, the durometer of the tools and what the so a durometer is basically you know if you if you're touching against stone you are is a tremendous amount of hardness if you're pushing against um a uh, 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 cotton pillow it's extremely soft mm -hmm. you know <clears throat> so we have a threshold of implicit tension in an object that is going to put pressure into your body and so foam rollers are the most ubiquitous um, tool that people use, and then lacrosse balls. Compressed foam is extremely hard. I don't know if you've laid on a black foam roller lately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really hard. Um, and a lacrosse ball is extremely hard. It has no yield at all. Neither one of these objects have any yield. 
So that means all you do is have forces smushing your tissues completely. So there's, there's no chance of, of, um, of the tool conforming to your form. Now, a soft tool allows you to indent the tool as well, right? So like a, a, an inflated uh, cordless ball like this, when you lay on it, you're indenting it as much as it's indenting you, right? When I, when I hold on to your arm, your tissue de deforms my tissue, unless I slap you. If I slap you really quickly, there's a hardness to just because of the properties of the fluid properties in my body mm -hmm. and the way, um, the way collagen and elastin are organized in the body, um, I can become very, very hard and slap you very right, rapidly. Yeah. But if I let my hand rest on you, we kind of melt and mold in together. So that's living flesh. But an, an object doesn't have all of the wonderful properties that, that human touch has. So we want to try to have objects that mimic human touch more so than, um, than don't. In this research... Uh, there were two papers out of 99 papers that talked about hardness. Wow. So you have a lot. And, and what, why this is important is because the research on self-myofascial release, especially because the most is with foam rollers and sticks, is all over the place. Like some of it says it helps, some of it says it doesn't. It's just all over the place. Um, the papers that talked about the actual, the actual texture, the actual object and how hard it was, um, um, the two papers that covered that both said a softer tool is better for displacing tissue in the body. So you get more depth with a softer tool. Why? The body feels safe. The muscle spindle response doesn't block the tool from getting to the tissue target. So we increase range of motion we're able to actually move tissue more. So we, we um, er eradicate some of the thickening, you know, the agglomeration of fluids that happen within um, an adhesed area. Uh, we lengthen those tissues, and that means range of motion improves. So there's a really cool Korean study that, uh, that's my favorite because it's like the one, they did so many meticulous tests, and then they also basically did a big highlight of like what's missing here from us and what is still needed mm -hmm. to look at hardness as a, as a, I think this is an, a foundational thing that we need to look at because how is the tool interacting with the person? And each person is so different in the texture of their tension. This goes back. We're not just, nobody's a zoo animal. Like we are all, we're, like there is no identical person to another identical person. Each person comes, even though you look, might look fit. I mean, like you're stressed to the bejeebus and you know, you like bejeebus. You know what I mean? I'm not I saying you. I'm just saying the, the, the every man. I have my moments. Right, we all do. So anyway, I just think this is a foundational thing that's missing and that's a big call out I do in, um, in, in the chapter. But again, I'm super biased because I've been a soft tool person for years because I wanted something that felt like my massage teacher was touching mm -hmm. me. I didn't want something that felt like I had to do so much work to dissociate to let the tool enter me. Yeah. Right. So when I have this really hard tool, you're just like, okay, let me just breathe really hard. Let me just kind of check out. Right. And so this dissociate, and this is interesting, this brings us back to polyvagal theory. So if I have to dissociate to let body work actually happen to me, was I really there? Yeah. And mm. that would be called a shutdown space. If I have to dissociate, I'm going into shutdown in order to be victimized by this hard thing. It's interesting. Um, <coughs> myself, my partner, we see uh, Maori healers. Oh my gosh, yes. Which they have a raku. Yes. Which is a stick. Yes. That's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. I, I really enjoy it. I enjoy standing on it. And our osteopath, who uh, she's pra she practices. She's part Maori. Maori. <laughs> she's not part Maori, but she, she works really closely with them. Yeah. But it's, I mean, you can have like a 20 stone guy yep. standing on my calf. On your calves. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you feel straight afterwards? Well, I, the, the first time I had it, I was just in tears, but not through pain, just this huge emotional release. And then yeah. I felt as uh, like high. High as a kite. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's there is some, there is something very therapeutic about 
about that release. I'm not like discounting that, but I'm saying do you have we to have to, to put ourselves. You have to go to get in your space, and um, I I want everybody. I don't want there to be a barrier to entry. Yeah. I don't want people to feel threatened that this is going to hurt their calves yeah. when they get in there because it doesn't have to hurt to work. No, there's, well, there's a huge amount of trust. It, it was really interesting to see how they pick. You you go in and it's, uh, I've forgotten, Atta, who was the, she's the, the mama. She says, you see that person. You oh, amazing. Person. Right. And then I got, I got the son who was like this all black <laughs> size of a guy. I was like, oh, okay, it's going to be like this. And then I've had other, you know, j- just depending on, yeah. they pick it depending on s- yeah. what they're feeling. And some so, people yeah. really were like, you know, we well, can hear them. It's an it's an open. <laughs> yes, an open, yeah, no, it's, it's a group. It's, it's yeah. a group. They're moving around. And that's interesting. So that's a whole ventral vagal thing. Like there's a there's a there's a, a social pressure also in that setting to comply to the um, massage or mm. to you know sort of to be able to take it in a way. Um, it's, yeah, so many interesting dynamics you're talking about there. You could see the people that just didn't want to be touched. Yeah. But, but they were there. And then I guess that begs a, or poses a question. It's like kind of, why are you here? Or just being here might be enough mm. to sit and have a cup of tea. Yeah. As with, you don't need to do that. Yeah. It's almost too, yeah. they're like, no, I want to have the, the, the experience. experience. Yeah. But if you check out, then it's... Are you really having you're it? You're just giving someone your power yeah yeah so it's really interesting i mean but i my thing is i want people to do it themselves and so i don't have to worry about a maori but it's like i'm not going to tell my mother to roll a lacrosse ball on her foot she will damage her foot it's so fragile Mm. i mean a foot is robust but my mom's had you know a number of surgeries on her feet so her bones aren't in that great of shape and um and i want everybody to be able to feel empowered to self-treat themselves and so it would not be responsible for me because you know i can i can i can walk on rocks and i can use a marble on my i don't i mean i you know it's like i could but but for you know i'm saying self-empowerment's the goal isn't it self-empowerment's the goal and self-knowledge is the goal so also feeling yourself um being able to be with yourself as you transform your relationship to discomfort or felt sense or bringing sense being able to to feel something in your body i mean the people that work with me privately or in my group classes that often like they are just not seen felt or heard in other um in other situations. I mean, yeah. most people, I know their medical records inside and out. And they're like, oh, so this time I went to the neurologist and he did all these tests. There's nothing wrong with any of my nerves. And, but like, this is always hurting me all the time. The only thing that gets me out of pain is your class. You know, and it's, I hear this all the time because it's, 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 um, it's a compound. Like we compound. I'm, see, I'm wondering if that wet has gone onto the wood floor. There's a towel in the bathroom you just open that. Yeah. No. That'd be great. It's on the edge. Oh, it's just on the edge? Okay. So the, the compounding effects of breath, position, safety, uh, awareness, and knowing that you're in a space where if anything feels unsafe, and I, and I don't that word can get overused. So if anything feels, let's just say it for now, that if anything feels unsafe, we have lots of ways of modifying or transforming so that you're still going to find the same target that everybody else is. So there, you do need to push yourself. You do need to engage in healthy risk in, in the context of movement. Like if you are only doing the same thing all the time, you're just, you're, you're as complacent and sedentary because you're not stimulating yourself novelly yeah. so you know there has to be people have to feel like they're they are allowed to coax their tissues they're allowed to coax their movement they're allowed to play in their home and um so i think that's why cross training and crossfit and uh, this is like the most important thing ever that the yogi goes to crossfit yeah. and that the crossfitter goes to the meditation den and the opposites it, it has to be yeah. and then find all the shades of gray in between yeah. like go to the sexy mama dance class 
and go like go do that don't be rigid in in your practice whatever your practice is hopefully you have one people listening to this do but I like I also I really like to find the people that don't have a practice and that are uh, scared of their bodies and they're afraid of being in there they're afraid of discovering things I love meeting those people yeah it's quite hard to think about being scared of one's body most like, people are yeah I mean we've just always been you guys are athletes uh, uh, well, yeah. well thank you um, <laughs> <laughs> you should see these guys studs um, that's what that's why we don't really film it <laughs> so it's the illusion um, well, well I would suggest that you know we we're now four years into this process of being with we move and we're sitting here having these conversations and and still like trying to understand everything that's going on in these conversations you know we we spent serious time you'll never understand everything yeah. i said today i don't even know if i understand everything i said today right but you know we're coming across <laughs> these ideas four years into the journey yeah four years intentionally into a journey about learning about the body and the tools etc you know how many people actually spend that amount of time you know going through that journey i, I noticed that you have the aim wedges we, oh we, yeah, um, Gary. Yeah, we know Gary. And we, we I do too. <laughs> I love Gary. We podcasted with him a few months ago and, and I've been seeing one of his um, one of his teachers for yes. the past year or so. Yes. And actually, I've had to see him for a year to unravel everything that's going on yes. and it taking time to unravel. And I've recommended other people go and see him. Yes. Uh, this guy called Dom. And I get emails back from them within like a month of seeing him saying, well, you know, kind of, you know, should I continue to see him? Nothing's, it's like, you don't, this doesn't happen overnight. No, this is a process. Yeah. And if you understand, if you understand fascia, it takes two years for your fascial, your entire fascial body to remodel. Like you have cell turnover. We, we have cell turnover. Every, every cell in your body turns over. But if you want to literally sh have a new skin, a new fascial skin, it takes two years for that cycle to complete itself. Right. And so what do you start with Gary? You know, I started doing Gary's work probably like four years ago, five years ago, one, one of our teachers has trained with him and that's how I got introduced to his work. And then I finally got to go work with him. Um, oh, we actually were co-teaching at a conference together in Australia, April of last year. And then this year I got to go up to Santa Cruz and spend three days with him in April, uh, this past April. And it's like, um, first of all, he's a genius. Like no problem saying Gary Ward's a genius. And, and Gary is still working out his methodology so that, Everybody can understand it. Mm. Um, it's absolutely beautiful methodology, and not methodology. Um, it's just an under. It's just helping people be able to be in their bones, and that's kind of a bizarre thing because we <laughs> anyway. But it will take time, significant amount of time. Mm. But you're worth it. You want a long life. Yeah. And not everything yeah. moves at rapid speed. Like you can see muscles build really quickly. The 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 subtle changes in your fascial system, this is this is this is the sloth approach mm. to fitness. The sloth is no less fit than the than the tiger. So we have to have an appreciation of those sloth elements in our body. And I don't mean you're a sloth, you're like lazy on the couch. You've seen sloth move. Mm. How gorgeously graceful they are. I dare you to move as slow as a sloth. Yeah, it's strong. Right. We, uh, we, we see an Ashtangi, actually, and we both went to her workshop and she got us... <coughs> Ash the practice was taking three hours plus. She was getting mm -hmm. us to move that slowly. Mm. And it was like... Phew. Start getting hungry. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see a lot of things going that slowly. Yeah. And feel a lot of things. She was very anatomical. Yeah, I can appreciate yeah. that for sure. I think maybe it goes back to the original, uh, right at the beginning where we were talking about chronic, chronic tension. Yeah. And everything's certainly in this consumerist society that, that I live in in London and or in LA or yeah. New York. Everything's rushed. Everything's really quick. Yeah. Gary's program of, uh, you know, self-awareness program how many people take, or, you know, really slow. <laughs> yeah. how valuable it is to spend 15 or 20 minutes just feeling your body in the morning. <laughs> and then well, maybe that's a meditation practice. Absolutely. You know, maybe that's a, a it, slow yoga practice. It is a meditation practice. But we, we, we're under chronic tension because everything's rushed. Yes. Everything's stressed. Yes. There's emails to answer, life to live, kids to take to school, et cetera, et cetera. We, we're not really in, a, in an environment that's conducive to self-care to press pause yeah yeah 
so so then <laughs> going back to what we were just saying it's taken us four years to kind of get to a stage where it's like okay <laughs> You know, two years ago, I brought a really tough plastic tool in just outside of Paris to, yeah. you know, really get into my into my legs yeah. or, or whatever else it was that was that was painful. And it's taken me that process of going through that and still being in pain to be like yeah, searching around for the other answers. Maybe I need less. Maybe I need to do less to get mm. more out of my body. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it is a different it's a different rail all on the same train and if you've never gone onto that rail and you, you know, every, you're trying to put out, you keep trying to put out the fires on the rail that you're on. Um, it's not like, Oh, well I need to do less reps. It's no, I, I need to completely regress and get to my skeleton and feel the things that are really pulling my skeleton this way or that, because how your body is there is how your body mm. is doing your RDLs. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. And even just trying to reposition yourself while you're doing your RDLs isn't necessarily changing the foundational stuff. Yeah. I love, I love his approach. I feel it's, I feel like he is a, a like a Feldenkrais. He really mm. is onto something and I just hope to see his work continue to uh, improve its footprint worldwide. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. We're trying, we're trying to help him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, 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 my head's going, you're not saying that a hard tool is better or worse. Yes, it's, I am. <laughs> uh, you are. Or is it the approach I, to what I would say is soft enough? I, um, I, I'd say that there, uh, for, there will definitely be people who have adapted up that a hard tool does not create muscle bracing in their body. Um, so, but I think, that is a very small percentage of just yeah. like, just like the percentage of people who are truly hypermobile is a very small percentage, right? The percentage of people that truly are able to let go of any type of neurological tension. Um, and so that their tissue is totally compliant. The soft tool will work for them also, but for them, a hard tool does not present threat. So I do think that there are some people who can tolerate a hard tool, but, but, um, so these are better suited to everyone. Oh, abs- the these, this is an every person thing, but we have Olympic athletes and we have NFL, NHL, NBA, MLB. We have every single, every single major league professional athletic organization. Some team is using our tools. Um, the year that the Cavaliers won, oh, you guys don't know you're in England. Anyway, that was a big deal. Um, one our, of our, our Cavaliers were different. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, Cleveland Cavaliers, um, was a really big deal when they won, um, the, Oh shoot! What's the name of the big basketball game here we play? What is it? It's the one, the the, it's the Super Bowl of basketball. I can't believe I can't remember the name. Anyway, they won, and um, the year that they won, uh, one of our teachers up in Cleveland was was their mobility person. Now, they were hiring her, and she was using our tools. Uh, we weren't sponsoring them. We didn't pay two million dollars, so we can't like we don't have pictures of them using our tools because if you have pictures of guys using your tools on the sidelines, that company has sent them the tools and paid $2 million to have the tools. So you'll see beautiful, shiny tools. Like these are cheap. These are very cheap. These are so that my mother and my aunt and the girls that, you know, that she volunteers for, anybody can afford them. That's my goal. I want every person to have this power and not just an elite athlete to be able to, but believe me, elite athletes are using them too, mm. as well as um, other tools that people are paying them $2 million to use. I know this, these things. I love that it's accessible. We have a conversation every so often, accessible in terms of economics, because we yeah. have a conversation every so often about food. And you know, the the big problem with people eating healthy, or it seems to be, or seems to it's me really is- expensive. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, so how can you, you know, if someone's on benefits or welfare or have a large family or the, just don't come from a great economic background how can you then you know lambast them for not eating healthy so yeah they can't, they can't afford it yeah <laughs> get a whole foods and just buy breakfast it's like nine dollars 30 bucks oh, $30. You know, sure. for, for not two, even nine you know? You're right yeah nine gets you a drink <laughs> that's what gets you a, doesn't doesn't get you a smoothie gets you the water yeah <laughs> right so having tools that are yeah th- that people can access to make a huge difference to their life is yeah no, my dad's a doctor. He prescribes medicines. Medicines are very expensive. 
even with insurance, they're very mm. expensive. These are rubber drugs. You know, you buy them once, you take care yeah. of them, they'll last a very long time. You and don't have to renew your prescription for a long time. And self-responsibility yeah. of actually you have the power to do something about yeah. what's that, hurting. That's the cheapest and most elusive thing of yeah. it all. Self-responsibility. Yeah. Buying them alone doesn't... No. Do well, it. that's why we have a lot of free content for people. We have paid for content too, but there's tons of free content. And, you know, on my Instagram and our, our brand page, we do giveaways, you know, like yeah. try to make it. People can't get it somehow we get it to them we do a lot of volunteer stuff we work with a lot of different um, charity organizations and a lot of our teachers work with different um, trauma-based um, refugee camps and um, people in need that um, don't get instruction either I mean the instruction is really helpful because the education empowers you so we try to find our way to help as many people as possible yeah, we've had a lot of terrible things happen in the U.S. in the last um, few years. And a lot of our teachers have been frontline care workers mm -hmm. with and caring for the caretakers that are also frontline. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So that's an important um, piece that we like to do is help with the, uh, the compassion fatigue that hap happens with, with care workers or military um, personnel or police. You know, we've got some really, our teaching team is amazing. Mm. How yeah. many... Oh, we have about 500 yoga tune-up teachers worldwide. And then we also have a separate certificate just for role model. Um, so yoga tune-up teaches you the um, our movement programming concept. Role model certificate is just about the soft tissue self-care. So there's, there's really two different tracks within our company. Right. Um, and... Um, and there, you know, there's overlap in terms of, you know, where we're coming from with this, this sort of self-care empowerment. Um, what I just totally lost train of thought. So I actually don't know the number of role model practitioners versus yoga tune up teachers, but yeah, yeah, growing. but we, we, yeah, we're growing. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Amazing. How do people find out about you? Well, that's easy because you're going to have a link somewhere <laughs> where here, yeah, right? Yeah. Or there's magazine or just, um, tune up fitness.com is the website tune up fitness.com and on Facebook tune up fitness or Jill Miller. I have an author page on Facebook, uh, but mostly I'm really personally very busy on Instagram. Yeah. And my, mm. my current handle is at yoga tune up all one word. And then the brand page is at tune up fitness. And they're the ones that do the giveaways. I don't cause I'm too busy with my children and my opinions, uh, but they are very, you know, very structured filming schedules. <laughs> What's that? And filming schedules. And filming schedules. Yes. We're filming this week with Katie Bowman, a program. And then with my friend, Tom Myers, doing a program called Rolling Along the Anatomy Trains. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with his um, fascia model, of his Meridian model of uh, fascial, functional fascia, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So we're showing people how to self-treat with, with his Anatomy Trains model. So excited. He's going to be staying here at the house, and we'll be sh going back and forth to the studio and, and filming. And then we'll be doing another live version of this together next summer at his institute in Maine. It'll be my third year there. He's an amazing person and what a legend. Mm. And are you in the UK anytime soon? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to really say that loud to the microphone. I will be at Tri Yoga in London December 4th and 5th for the okay. role model practitioner training. And that's a, it's actually a Wednesday, Thursday. It's a midweek training because right. I can't make it there on the weekend. Don't ask. But that's December. And then july of next year i'll be doing just a basic intro to role model i think that's july 20th but then july 21st to 23rd that's a monday tuesday wednesday at tri yoga camden the breath and bliss immersion so if any of the polyvagal stuff uh, was intriguing to you or you want to learn uh, novel recovery based strategies for every type of community from you know from sports teams to working in refugee camps to helping people um, get into their skin and uh, create a relaxation response create a therapeutic recovery response that is the course for you and that's we have so many different types of professionals in all of our courses but the breath and bliss uh, we get a lot of um, social workers therapists psychologists as well as yoga teachers pilates um, athletic coaches physios um, chiros it's awesome great a real mix oh it's a it's a great interdisciplinary mix and that's that's we really believe in interdisciplinarism, yeah. interdisciplinarianism um, and cross-training for, for health. Yeah. And, and you get that in the breath and bliss immersion. Amazing. 
Yeah. So can anyone go to that? Anybody can go to that. There is no barrier to entry to our program. So there will usually be a couple of people just in there for their own edification as well as professionals. And, you know, we're able to scale that in the classroom and make everybody feel comfortable no matter what their level of um, uh, fluency in anatomy is or their fluency or comfort level with the body. Yeah. Great. Awesome stuff. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. You're very welcome. (laughs) I appreciate you coming here. (laughs) It's no problem for us to come to LA. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful here. You guys nailed it. It's been raining throughout the past 10 days and it's kind of gray and cold in London. So Yeah, it always is. <laughs> yeah. I lived there for a very short period of time. Oh, really? In college. Yeah, I lived in Camden and I went to, wow. yeah, I was studying performance. So I spent a few months there. Was Interesting it- Sundays in Camden. Sundays? Yeah, when the market opens. Oh, man, it was weird. Yeah. <laughs> but I would buy chestnuts. I just remember chestnuts. I was always... They always smell great. <laughs> Never bought them. Oh, they have all the worms in them. They like... You would open it and there'd be like dead maggots in there. It's disgusting. It's good to know. They smell good and that's as far yeah. as... <laughs> I've bypassed that experience. Can't wait to be there in December. <laughs> great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jill. You're welcome. <laughs>